Hey, check out this railroad overpass behind me. It's full of free food. Pigeons, the oldest domesticated bird, used for food and various other vital functions since ancient Egypt and Mesopotamia, and probably long before that. Pigeons are tasty birds. The ones roosting up in those girders up there are probably descended from birds that were brought here to the Americas expressly as a food source. If that surprises you, that's probably because you are like me, a longtime resident of a highly developed urbanized country where pigeons have developed a reputation as being dirty. Rats with wings, people call them, but this idea that pigeons are particularly gross or unpleasant is really very recent and, I think it's fair to say, inaccurate. Pigeons are as pure and gentle as doves. How do I know that? Because doves are pigeons. Pigeon. Pigeon is literally just the French word for dove. There is no scientific distinction between them. They're all columbiforms, an order of stout little bird species with plump bodies, little necks, little feet, little everything really, other than their meaty breasts. In English, we colloquially use dove to describe smaller and sometimes lighter colored species of columbidae, and we use pigeon to describe the bigger species, but there's really no consistency to it. It would have been just as accurate a translation to say, lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descended like a pigeon. Pigeons are holy. All through human history, they were beloved. Uh, they were worshipped as fertility goddesses, as the image of the Holy Ghost of, of Jesus Christ. That is Andrew Bleckman, author of Pigeons, the fascinating saga of the world's most revered and reviled bird. And while there are more than 300 species of pigeon, Bleckman in his book here is chiefly concerned with the domestic pigeon that we see up in that overpass. Pigeons or descendants of pigeons that have been bred by humans over thousands of years for various qualities. There's a, there's a annual pigeon pageant. That's kind of like the Westminster Dog Show, except for uh, nobody attends it, except for the pigeon people. <laughs> it's not televised. Uh, but you've never, seen, you've never seen pigeons look anything like this. But just as the incredible variety of domestic dogs we know all have the same basic wild ancestor, wolves, all these domestic pigeons are descended from this guy, the rock pigeon, or rock dove. Their native range is in dark red there. The pink is everywhere that humans have introduced them in large numbers. It's a symbiotic relationship. Ever since we had agriculture, they would basically eat the leftover seeds you know, that dropped on the ground. And uh, we find them in cities because they typically are, they live on cliffs. They don't, you, know, you don't see pigeons in trees. They don't do trees. And our, our, our cities are nothing but basically concrete cliffs everywhere. And so that's why they're attracted to our cities. Indeed, part of the reason domestic and wild rock pigeons look so similar is that they are similar. We didn't really do that much to domesticate them. The rock pigeon is naturally a perfect livestock animal. They breed prolifically, they naturally hang out together in huge, dense flocks, and they are extremely gentle and social. These are the classic traits of a species that practice what biologists call predator satiation. The main way they avoid being eaten is to occur and congregate in such huge numbers that the raccoons couldn't possibly eat all of them. Or the humans, I suppose. All through medieval Europe and before, actually going back to the ancient Persians and Mesopotamia, you'd have dovecotes or dovecots, which are you know, cylindrical buildings with little holes in them inside, and they would roost inside, and then it was a source of year-round protein. Usually the royalty would do it, but you could just kind of pluck a bird when you were ready. Dovecoats were also part of the other primary use that humans have historically had for pigeons, and that is as messengers. Pigeons have remarkable homing abilities that scientists still don't fully understand. It might have to do with their awareness of the sun, or maybe with uh, smell, they can smell their way around, or it might actually be their awareness of the Earth's gravitational fields. But regardless, you can take a pigeon and take it hundreds of miles away from the roost where it was born, let it go, and it will find its way straight home where it was born. 
So imagine that you're an ancient army going out on campaign. When you leave the seat of your power, you take some pigeons with you from your dovecoat, and you march away with them, and then when it's time to send news of your victory home, or to plead desperately for reinforcements, you write a little scroll, you tie it to the pigeon's leg, and you just let it fly home. The ones that are bred for racing, they can travel 600 miles to their loft, their home loft, like, like a laser-guided laser missile uh, from 600 miles away without stopping for food, water, or rest from a place they've never even been before at, at 60 miles an hour. This explains why pigeon breast meat looks like this. Bright red, full of myoglobin and slow twitch muscle fibers, optimized for long-term sustained effort, just like beef. Culinarily, pigeon is a red meat and tastes good when cooked rare, same as duck breast. Oh, like the pan? It's from the sponsor of this video, Misen. Let me thank them real quick. Somebody asked me recently what basic pan I would recommend to a young person starting out, and I said Misen's 10-inch stainless steel skillet. If that story wasn't true, I wouldn't have volunteered it just now. As far as I know, no other stainless pan on the market for this little money is so robustly constructed. This thing is heavy and solid. The oven-proof handle feels really comfortable and secure in your hand. It's the ideal five-ply sandwich of metals with aluminum alloy inside for rapid heating and stainless on the outside for easy cleaning and maintenance. And the edges are steep, which means you get a wider surface area than cheaper pans that literally cut corners. Follow my link in the description. Use promo code RAGUSIA for 20% off your first order from Misen on this pan or anything. Again, my link and code in the description save 20% on your first order. Thank you, Misen. And maybe that pink pigeon breast grosses you out, but I guarantee you it is making some French person real excited right now. Is it safe to eat like that? Well, I've only been able to find one study, and it's 20 years old, but these researchers at UC Davis found Salmonella and Campylobacter levels on commercial pigeon farms to be extremely low compared to chicken and turkey farms. But now you may be thinking, wait a minute, that sentence doesn't say anything about pigeon. It's talking about squab? I guess in the culinary world, they, they refer to it as squab, which is a Scandinavian word for basically fat and juicy. Most pigeons that are eaten are, um, uh, they're baby pigeons. They're basically the milk-fed veal of the sky. Yeah, so this is the kind of sad part. A squab is a pigeon that has grown really big and fat but it has not yet become fully fledged, meaning it has not yet flown out of the nest. As soon as the bird starts flying, it loses weight rapidly and the meat gets tougher. And perhaps most significantly, it becomes way harder to catch. To harvest a squab, all you do is pick it up. Or if it's in the wild up in a high nest or something, you can reach up with a long pole and just knock it out of the nest. There are accounts of Native Americans using exactly that technique to hunt the pigeon species that is indigenous to this continent, which is the passenger pigeon. These are not passenger pigeons. These are descended from domesticated rock pigeons brought here 400 years ago by European colonists. This is the last known passenger pigeon, Martha. She died in 1914 in the Cincinnati Zoo. Passenger pigeons were called that because they passed by. They migrated in vast flocks from their breeding zone in red there to the forests in orange where they would feast on the fruits and nuts of trees. The story of how people drove the passenger pigeon to extinction is virtually identical to the story of how we almost drove the American bison to extinction. I have a whole video about that in the description. Basically, habitat destruction, vast, vast commercial hunting that was in enabled by the growth of railroads and farmers shooting them down in huge numbers to keep them from feasting and pooping on the crops. And here we come back where we started, the very recent turn of events in which pigeons came to be regarded in some places as dirty. And that really comes from uh, post-World War II. There was a, just a giant increase in prosperity in the Western world. Uh, particularly the United States, actually, since given that we had won the war, and we were damaged like the rest of Europe was by the war. And so post-World War II, the economy grew dramatically. Food became very cheap. Uh, there was all of a sudden you could buy bread in the grocery store. It costs, you know, pennies. Um, and as food got really cheap, 
so uh, a lot of it would end up on the ground. You know, there was a lot of waste, whether it was in the trash or people would just, you know, kind of end up on the ground, just like pizza crust and donuts do today. Um, so the same thing. And so the more food that was available, the more pigeons you would have. And all of a sudden, something that seemed kind of, you know, cute and would animate, you know, urban life seemed less cute when there was more of them. Pigeons roosting on buildings in huge numbers means huge piles of poop underneath them. Pigeons don't poop especially more than other birds, and their poop isn't especially hazardous. There are simply more pigeons among us, and they congregate in big groups, and everybody poops. As Andrew Blechman puts it, pigeons are simply as clean or as dirty as our cities are. Probably best not to eat the ones in the park. Though Ernest Hemingway purportedly did just that, when he was poor, living with his young family in Paris, and writing what would become his memoir, A Movable Feast. He, said he would push his little Mr. Bumble, I think he called him, his little kid in a baby carriage, um, th through the Bois de Boulogne and, in the city, and uh, he'd grab a pigeon, ring its neck, and stick it up in the baby carriage under the blanket next to his kid, go home and cook it. At least that's what he said he did, but apparently he did it a lot. You do you, right? <laughs>